this is. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't know, this is Maria. Maria and I go way back. Maria's been my good friend since 1996, 7, 97, I think. Maria is serving the Lord all over Asia. And uh, her husband, Henry, is going to be here soon. And they're missionaries, if you don't know, from Praise. And we support them. Uh, Henry's ordained from Praise. And... Um, Henry will be coming from China this Saturday. And so just be praying for them. That's who our team that went to China, that's who was their host and who they stayed with and were, had such an awesome time. So Maria and I and my wife have been staying up late night, every night getting caught up since we haven't seen each other for two years. Thank God my wife let me sleep in this morning so I'm not tired. <laughs> but she's a wonderful, they have many stories so make sure you uh, greet them and and hear what God's doing all over the world in their lives. Amen. Um, Henry will be ministering on a Wednesday night in July. So when I'm in Africa, as you know, my wife and I will be going to Africa and be praying also. If you like to sow into that, none of it goes to me and my wife, but to what we're going to be doing over there, helping establish a business in Africa that they can become self-sufficient. If you'd like to sow into that, pray about that. Um, but when I'm away, Henry will be ministering here on the 16th. Amen. 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 And um, yeah, that's it. So let's go into life lessons from the life of Samuel. Going to go into Samuel. We've started with Adam and now we're on Samuel. So we started last September. So we're going to get all the way through the life of Samuel. We're going to go through ch seven chapters tonight. But, of course, I'm not going to read every verse. <laughs> just going to highlight some stuff. And um, next week we're going, to, going into Saul. And then following, I was going to skip Saul, but I'm going to hit Saul. Because you can learn stuff from those who have done a lot of good. And you can learn stuff from those who have done a lot of bad, right? Because we're prone to do bad just as well we're prone to do good. So we need to learn what not to do. So Saul will teach us a lot of, uh, about what not to do. Especially as a leader. And then, the following week, we'll have David Stabler with us, who will be teaching on David. So he will be with us, missionary who's in Florida. He'll be here. He was the former youth pastor before I was here, if you don't know that. Okay, so here we go. Life lessons from the life of Samuel. We have it up. All right, great. 1 Samuel 1, 10, and 11 are going to be the first verses that we're going to hit. So leading up to that, first we see Hannah was the mother of Samuel. Hannah was not able to give birth. And in um, that time, it, was, it meant everything as a woman to have children. And if you, didn't have, if you weren't able to have a child, you were looked down upon severely. So Hannah was not able to have a child. The worst thing was is that she'd go up to give, their, her and her husband would go up to give their offerings every, every year to the temple. And Eli, who was the priest, his children weren't very nice. You ever know any pastor's kids that are not very... Not mine, right? No. I had great kids. But the pastor's kids were not very nice. And I think it's... How do you say his name? Phineas? Phineas would just tear her apart. Would just tell her, like... Just make fun of her for not being able to have children. So she would go there to worship the Lord. And while she's trying to worship the Lord, you got this little kid saying all kinds of bad stuff and making you feel horrible and can't wait till you leave. So up to this point, here we go in verse 10, verse 11. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime and as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will will never be cut. This just reminds me of my first child was actually, um, what do you call it? Um, not a stillborn, but anyway, he didn't come out. And um, so, and there was a possible a second one. 
And so my, you know, of course that brought us to a place of anguish, my wife specifically. But I remember a lady praying for us at the church in Washington State and praying these scriptures actually over us. And shortly after, Elisha came along. And because my wife had that prayer that we would dedicate our children, of course, unto the Lord. So life lesson number one. God responds to prayers that are not self-based, but kingdom-based. Meaning prayers that are about the greater purpose beyond our needs being met. Where what we receive from God is dedicated back to Him for His purposes. A lot of people go to God for all kinds of stuff. Not everything gets answered. Because often our prayers are not from the right heart. We ask amiss. God is all about the heart. And if we really have a heart for God, we're not just using God for what He can give us. If we have a really heart for God, what He gives us, we really give it right back to Him. We use it for Him. That means our house. That means our car. That means all of our money. That means, you know, it's not just about giving 10%. It's about giving everything we have for His purpose. That doesn't mean giving it just to the church. There's a lot more to His purpose than just what goes on here. But we're using all that we have, all that we are, our children, which is sometimes the hardest thing to surrender back to God because we like to control them and make sure they go the way we want them to go. But we want to make sure they're going the way God wants them to go. That's not always what we want. So, Hannah, and, and sometimes we're going through something in our life and we don't understand that it's way beyond just us why we're going through what we're going through. Hannah, being barren, represented barren Israel. She was representing the entire nation. Her struggle was not just her struggle, it was the nation's struggle. Because God was going to use her to, uh, to change the nation. She was going to use her son. So her personal misfortune was bigger than herself. It was due to the state of the nation that God would use her cry to not only meet her need for a child, but also the nation needed a righteous judge. Somebody who could lead them by his example in the ways of God. So we got to look at our, some of our situations and we're like, why God? Why God? Why am I going through this, God? And maybe it's way beyond you. Maybe it's because of your family members, your friends, your neighborhood, your nation. There's something that God's about to do and it's just not going to happen overnight. Your prayer being answered because it's bigger than ourselves. Amen? So and then we see that God honors her prayer and gives her the son Samuel. And now let's look at 1 Samuel 2, 1 through 10. Have you ever received something so big from God that you just got so excited you just had to just praise the Lord? <laughs> Hopefully all the time. You know, praise God. It was just, um, where is she? Amanda just took off. But Amanda was just telling me, I prayed with her last week for a job. The job that she wanted didn't work out. So we prayed for another job. And right away, there she is. What happened, Amanda? You got a job. <laughs> Your prayer was answered. So were you excited about that? <laughs> awesome. So one of the things that is most exciting to me, I mean, the thing, you, if you really want to bless me, encourage me, the greatest encouragement is when you come and tell me a prayer that was answered. Or you come and tell me something that maybe I said, Pastor Steve said something that we helped in teaching the Word and it helped you and it changed something in your life. To me, that's the greatest thing that I ever hear. I don't hear enough of it, so I love to hear. And it's not for my sake, it's just I love to hear what God's doing. You know, it encourages me that what I'm doing is helping people do what God wants to do through them. So here we go. Hannah is rejoicing. Then Hannah prayed, My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Isn't there a song like that? 
think so. I'm not going to sing it though. Stop acting so proud and haughty. Don't speak with such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows what you have done. He will judge your actions. The bow of the mighty is now broken. The bow of the mighty is now broken. And those who stumble are now strong. Those who are well fed are now starving. And those who are starving are now full. The childless woman now has seven children. The woman with many children wastes away. The Lord gives both death and life. He brings some down to the grave, but raises others up. The Lord makes some poor and others rich. He brings some down and he lifts others up. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. Anybody here ever been brought right out of the garbage dump? Just hearing a story today actually on, um, on uh, CBN, 700 Club, and it was a, a, a young lady who had to work in the, in, the India, in the Indian, the caste system. You know, if you're the bottom of the caste, your job basically is working the garbage dump, trying to find something that you can sell out of the garbage. And this little girl, that was her life. That was, there was no other choice. And that's not even worse. When that wasn't enough, her parents sold her into prostitution. Thank God the 700 Club has different uh, ministries and they reached out to her and she you got saved and got changed her whole life and she's a totally different person. But God loves to pull people right out of the garbage dump. Amen. He sets them among princes, placing them in seats of honor, for all the earth is the Lord's, and he has set the world in order. He will protect his faithful ones. Those who fight against the Lord will be shattered. So when you feel people fighting against you, and what the Lord is doing through you, trust me, it will be turned back on their head in due time. He thunders against them from heaven. The Lord judges throughout the earth. He gives power to his king. He increases the strength of his anointed one. So life lesson number two and number three. Our prayers answered. So Hannah's prayers answered. Established the revelation of God. Of who God is into who we now are. So it's one thing to have knowledge of something. It's another thing to experience it. Okay, so when you, when you learn the word, when you've heard the word, you've received the knowledge of the word, and now you begin to pray the word, and now the word's not just something you know, but you pray it, and then it comes and you receive it. Revelation, meaning you experience it. She prayed that she would receive a son, and now she received the son. She now had a revelation of God as her strength. She now knew God personally. It's great by faith to say, God, you are my strength. But it's another thing when you should have every reason to be weak, but you're strong because you've prayed and God has touched you and you, and you experience the difference. That's what really transforms us when it goes beyond head knowledge to heart change because we've prayed what we've heard and when we've seen the results and it's changed our life. So as God lifts us up from the pit of despair, guess what? He puts the enemies back in there. He takes us up and our enemies go right in. He loves to turn the whole thing around. When the enemies, when the people that don't like us when people that reject us and turn their back on us, uh, you know, think that they have us down, God loves to pull us up and then bring them right back down. Because God exalts the humble, and what happens to the proud? So let's go into a couple other verses. 1 Samuel 2, 17 and 18. So here we go. Hannah goes along with her promise. She brings Samuel to the priest. Eli dedicates him to service as a Levite in the house of the Lord. So the sin of these young men were very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. So we see that not everything going on in church was very holy at this time. Life lesson number four. You cannot trust that just because it is a religious institution, godly behavior, behavior will be in effect. What our heart is set on is what we will do no matter the environment. Do you think there's sin going on at Atlantic Christian School? <laughs> 
Do you think there's, <laughs> yeah, you have some experience? Okay, never mind. We won't go there. Do you think that there's some sin at our, you know, if we try to keep our kids in a sheltered environment, homeschool them and keep them? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but do you think by doing that, it's going to keep our kids from sin? When the heart is set upon sin, people are going to find a way to sin. No matter how much we try to hide it from them, and it's wise to try to protect our kids as much as we can. But bottom line is, when they want to sin, they're going to sin. Because their heart is set on it. And sin is not so much outwardly either, it is inwardly. My wife was seen very free from sin. She was very religious. She grew up in church. And she seemed to be very, very holy. But when my wife asked me all the sins that I've ever committed, and I began to tell her, and then she decided to leave me and not get married to me, God began to speak to her and told her of all her inward sin of hypocrisy because of being judgmental towards other people, gossiping, backbiting, all these kind of stuff, and God told her that was just as bad. It might have been even worse because you know better. I was ignorant in the world, lost in sin. So, <laughs> it didn't take long before she was running back to me. Praise God. Hallelujah. God is merciful. <laughs> so, religious institutions don't mean a thing. You figure um, it was a big deal. Hannah was dedicating this child to the Lord. He would be in this beautiful, holy environment. You know, when I first, soon after I got saved, and I wish Maria was in here because she'll have some, uh, she was there with me. Youth with a Mission. I was sent, I went to this this place called Youth with a Mission, and it, it was based in the in the islands in Saint Croix. I mean, you go to a mission base in the Caribbean, and I found out that they had an opening for basketball ministry. So here I am, a young man who loves basketball, and I love the Caribbean. I'm like, I'm in paradise. And I'm around a bunch of Christians night in, all day, all the time. I mean, what could be better? It must have been perfect. There was a lot of sin that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of people that struggle because where there's humans, no matter what environment, what bubble, there's going to be stuff going on. There was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. A lot of good went on just as well, but it's all about the heart. Amen? So here is Samuel growing up in what you would expect it to be a nice Christian environment. wasn't very Christian. So 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 26. Of course, the word Christian wasn't made then. It was Judaism, but 1 Samuel 2, 22 through 26. Now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. So daddy knew. They weren't getting away, or they weren't, it wasn't in the dark. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. So first of all, one of the sins that they were doing was the people would come and bring their offering, and the offering was supposed to be to the Lord, and they would take it. Just like many preachers today, <laughs> they say that the money's going here, but the really money's going right here. <laughs> and they're living large. And they were not, were just, and these would seem like the two main things that get a lot of people that are Christian leaders is money and what else? Girls. So here we go, the girl part. So he knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. Eli said to them, I have been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you are doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father. Mm. For the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel, though he was around this environment, meanwhile, Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with, his peop with the people. So when a child's heart is set upon the Lord, no matter what the environment is, they can do well. That means, if it's, and it's all depending on your situation, but I, I have my kids in public school and they're doing well at this point. 
You know, it's all the state of the heart. It all depends. Each situation is different. And if I see them turn, I might have to change the environment. But again, it's not just the environment. It is the heart. Life lesson number five and six. When the kids in our household do not listen and still do wrong, we must stop them. Well, Eli was trying to stop them. But he didn't stop them. Or we will be just as guilty, meaning we got to stop them. It's parents' responsibility not just to say stop, but to stop them. <laughs> you know, It's good to say stop, but that's not enough if they don't stop. So then we got to make them stop. Because we're just as guilty. Because they're in our household. When they're out on their own, when they've been released, then it's on their hand. You know, everything's on them. But when they're in our house, our, we're responsible, especially as the man of the house, to what goes on in the house. And if there's something that's not of God, we've got to stop it. Those that have a Christian title do not have a get-out-of-jail-free pass from the consequences of sin, but rather suffer a more severe penalty. For their sins is not just against another, but it's against God, representatives of God, representing Him. So when we sin, we're sinning against God. Anybody want to be a Christian leader? Anyone want to be a pastor? It's a heavy responsibility. Seems like we got a church on every corner. A lot of people, <laughs> you think everybody's called? I don't know. If it's necessary, but anyway, here we go. 1 Samuel 2, 29 and 32 through 36. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? This is the Lord speaking to Eli. For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. I mean, they're, they're getting rich off of Israel and what they're, and the people are giving. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel. But no members of your family will ever live out their days. The few not cut off from serving at my altar will survive, but only so their eyes can go blind and their hearts break and their children will die a violent death. And to prove that what I've said will come true, I will cause your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to die on the same day. Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family and they will be priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all of your surviving family will bow before him, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so we will have enough to eat. That's pretty severe punishment, huh? When we don't listen, <laughs> God's mercy only goes so far. There is judgment that follows continual rejecting his mercy. Life lesson number seven. Christian leaders that rob God for their own benefit will be replaced with the truly faithful and they will be turned into beggars who are always in need. So God has a way of turning things, removing people and putting them in the place of the people that they were stealing from. <laughs> nice kind words, huh? <laughs> Very uplifting. Now, this is, this. you know, we need to have the fear of the Lord. We need to have a fear of God, a, a, a godly fear. There's nothing wrong with a godly fear. So here we go, 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now, in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God, God had, had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Remember, he served the Lord, but he did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. 
Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed, and the Lord came and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, your servant is listening. Life lesson number eight. So just because someone serves the Lord does not mean they know the Lord. Yet, it is a servant heart that opens the ears to hear God's voice. For God calls those that will obey him. So just because people are serving the Lord doesn't mean that they know the Lord. But if we're serving the Lord with the right heart, God will open up our ears because God is waiting for people that are willing to listen and obey. People who have a heart to serve. A lot of times people come and become Christians because of what they can get, the benefits of God. But not really to serve God, but what could God do for them? And often, there's, I find a lot of people that say I, they don't really hear from God. They struggle. And they have a lot of struggles in their life. You know, I was talking to a, to a, a certain person, and, and you know, they, they, they love church. They love to hear, you know, the Word of God, and they, and they, but they have a lot of confusion and struggling in their life, and they're wondering why. And I asked them, basically, have you been born again? And reality was he never knew he had to. Never knew that you have to have an encounter with God. You can't just go to church and go through the motions and receive and hear God's voice. And that's why you have a lot of confusion in his life because he hasn't really gotten born again. He hasn't gotten to the point where he repented of living apart from God and said, now I will live for God. I'm giving my life, I'm surrendering my life and turning to God. And I believe that maybe a lot of us in this American culture, in this American church, have that kind of perception that just having God means going to church, you know, trying to do good, being active, but have never had a, an encounter with God. I've never had a born-again experience. And so I, I'm going to make sure when I'm talking with somebody and there's, there's things that people are like, but I don't have that experience. I don't have that confusion. Sometimes, you know, we're not perfect, but... When I gave my life to God, so many things changed. And I find a lot of Christians, or again, people with the name Christian don't have the same experience, don't have that change in their life. They're not experiencing the new life that God came to, that died for us to receive. And so I want us to always ask her, you know, when you're talking with people and people seem to really struggle, find out truly have they ever been born again? And lead people into that prayer. Lead people to get really saved, to really encounter God. To, and, it, and to do that, it means repenting, totally forsaking the old life, turning around and living a life totally set unto the Lord, making Him Lord of our life, not just putting God on our shelf and using Him whenever we want Him. So... So Samuel started hearing the voice of the Lord, and we see that Eli couldn't recognize it right away because Eli had gone so far away from God. And just because someone has a title doesn't mean that they hear from God. We can become, I could actually not hear from God and still preach. I could become pretty good at this. I've been doing it for a long time. So it's possible that a man or woman of God can do things and be used by God seemingly and really not, be, not, being, not knowing God's voice. So the greatest thing that God desires is for us, his people, to know his voice because he has a plan for us. He has a purpose for us. He has something for us to do each and every single day. And so are we, are we just going through the motions of Christianity, the religion, the tradition, or are we really walking in relationship with God, hearing from Him? Oops. Okay, uh, 1 Samuel three seventeen through 21. What did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything, and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. That's pretty harsh. I guess he's pretty angry that God is speaking to this boy and not to him. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied, or so Samuel told Eli everything. He didn't hold anything back. It is the Lord's will, Eli replied. Let him do what he thinks best. 
As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and everything Samuel said proved to be reliable. And all Israel, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and gave messages to Samuel there at the tabernacle. So life lesson number nine. God will speak to anyone who listens. Don't have to have a title. Don't have to have a position. You don't have to be on the pulpit. Wherever you're at, if you're willing to listen, God will speak to you. He will use whoever he can rely on to speak his truth. Even if it means the student correcting the master. People will respect anyone, no matter the age, if their prophetic words are proven to be true. So God can use us, no matter what age we are. If we're speaking the truth, and it's proven over time that what we're saying is accurate from God, people respect that because Samuel was young, but he was being respected all over the land, but Eli wasn't being respected at all. Okay, 1 Samuel 4, a bunch of verses in there. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they said, Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, they shouted with joy, with a loud voice, and made the ground shake. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated. Defeated again. The slaughter was great. Now they have the covenant and they're still defeated. The survivors turned and fled to their tents. The ark of God was captured and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed as Samuel had projected. She named the child Ichabod, which means where is the glory? For she said Israel's glory is gone. She named him this because the ark of God had been captured and because her father-in-law and husband were dead. That's Eli's wife. Then she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Life lesson number 10. God may turn his back on those who only call on him when in need of help. God may turn his back on those. God is very merciful. And I know, some of us know that even when we did not know God personally, when we were in the world and we called upon God and he came and he helped us. He was merciful. But there might come a time when we call out for help and God's mercy eventually becomes judgment. When people refuse to repent, repent, God's glory fades away. Do you believe that? Yeah. Can happen. God may not help us. He is merciful, but sometimes his mercy is not what we need. We actually need his judgment. Because we need to learn a lesson. Because we haven't learned it. He's told us time and time again. He's given us all kinds of reasons to return away from our sin, but we refuse to listen, so therefore judgment is what's needed. We need a whooping because that's the only thing that we'll do. I see, have you ever had children that you spoke to them, spoke to them, spoke to them, and it just didn't, wasn't enough? But that was, maybe they don't, you know, in American culture today, we can't spank children, but yes, we can, right? <laughs> Yep, we don't want to spoil our children. So there's not many things that will cause me to spank my kids, but disrespecting me does. Dishonoring me in my face is something that I feel like they deserve a whooping. Life lesson number 11. Let's first go 1 Samuel 5, 11 says, The people summoned the Philistine rulers again and begged them, Please send the ark of God of Israel back to its own country, or it will kill us all. For the deadly plague from God had already begun, and great fear was sweeping across the town. So now that they stole the ark of the covenant, which represented the presence of God, they try to have the presence of God and have sin at the same time. Doesn't work too well. Can any of us really enjoy sin anymore? It just doesn't, it just doesn't feel the same no more. You know, when I was in ignorance, it, didn't, it wasn't that as bad. You know, there was some kind of conscience there, but not much. But now that I'm in Christ, the Holy Spirit conviction makes sin absolutely horrible. At least the guilt that follows afterwards. 
So when we mix worship of God with pagan idolatry, and again, of course, we know idolatry in today's world isn't just worshiping um, gods made out of stone, but it's worshiping our gods made out of <laughs> plastic and made out of whatever material they're made out of, our gadgets, our things that we have all around us, the things that we put before God are, are our idolatry. So when we mix worship of God, we're worshiping God, but we're worshiping other things as well, we provoke God's wrath. We provoke God's wrath. Life lesson number 12. There's three more life lessons. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord with all your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods and your images of Ashtoreth. Turn your heart to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. God will only deliver those who really want it. People say it, but do they really want it? It's easy to say it religiously because that's what you, that's what you know the people want you to say. So you say it. Oh, I want to stop this. Oh, I'm going to stop that. Please pray for me. But deep down, you're not going to stop. If we really want God, we must give him our heart, which means removing all other idolatry. So to give God our heart means to surrender everything that we've ever put ahead of him. Amen? Life lesson number 13. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and offered it to the Lord as a whole burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel, and the Lord answered him. Just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day, and the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites defeated them. So we may have tasted, all of us, we have tasted defeat, haven't we? But the moment we get right with God, we begin to taste victory. So I don't want to taste defeat anymore. I don't want to live in sin anymore. I don't want to give reasons for me to have to be defeated again. If I stay right with God, not that I'm perfect, but the, when I fall, when I make a mistake, I repent, I get right with God as soon as possible, as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts me, then I don't have to suffer the consequences. So life lesson number 14. Samuel continued as Israel's judge for the rest of his life. Each year he traveled around, setting up his court, first at Bethel, then at Gilgal, then at Mizpah. He judged the people of Israel at each of these places. Then he, re he would return to his home at Ramah, and he would hear cases there too. And Samuel built an altar to the Lord at Ramah. And the last life lesson from the life of Samuel is we operate as God's judge. We operate as God's judge as we grow in the grace to rightly divide the word of truth and become more discerning of God's voice. For we're now able to bring counsel to others, pointing people to God and away from sin. So there is, you know, say, do, judge not. But we can judge. God has given us authority to judge, but not judge according to our standards, but according to God's standards, according to the fruit. And so we are able not to judge to condemn, but to judge to help people towards the Lord. We are all called to be counselors, to counsel our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord, to even help pull people out of wrath in the world towards God. So let's grow in the word so God can use this because there's a lot of people around us that are falling in sin and they just need somebody to help point them the way. Amen? That was a lot. I don't know, for me, I felt like it was a lot. So maybe it was a lot for you, but it was a lot for me. So a lot to chew on, a lot to meditate on. But as we go into worship, let's, um, you know, what, what really stands out about Samuel? Samuel, number one, he heard God's voice in a time where very few people heard God's voice. When very few people had visions. God raised up Samuel. I want to be a Samuel. I want to be somebody who knows God's voice. I want to be somebody who knows the word of God. And God can use me like he used Samuel to help point people to God himself. Amen. So let's just draw nearer to God and ask God 
to increase the sensitivity of our ears to his voice. Amen? And ask him to search our heart. Is there things in our life that are keeping us from hearing his voice more clearly? Do we have idols? Do we have things that we need to remove? Are we spending too much time watching television? Are we spending too much time listening to music and not being quiet before the Lord? You know, sometimes I find myself always listening to music, worship music, but sometimes God can't speak because I'm hearing the words of the song and God wants to speak to me something different than the words of the song. So we need to have times to be alone and to hear his voice. So let's search our heart. Let's let the Lord work in us and let's worship God for the next 20 minutes or so. And if you need prayer, I and other elders and prayer people on the prayer team will be here to pray with you. Amen. So Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for giving us ears to hear. We pray, Lord God, that you would search our hearts right now. Father God, give us bigger ears. Ears that are more sensitive to your voice. Father, we want to be used by you. We want you to speak to us each and every day. We want to fulfill your purpose for our lives. So, Father, we just open up our ears to hear your voice tonight, even right now, Lord God, as we go into worship. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, cry. 